Everybody's talking about big data and many different fields like finances, physics, biology, medicine, and many more. They're all talking about big data and all you can do uh, with it, right? But my question is, are they really doing big data? In a previous video, my PhD student Rebecca Tickle was talking about what is big data and trying to define it. And one of the main issues we have at the minute is that there isn't a standard definition of what big data actually is. Also another issue is the many faces that big data may have. So for example, you might be thinking of how to acquire that data, right? So installing different sensors and how to get that data and how to store that data. That's a different aspect to it, right? So the computational infrastructure, how to keep it secure. And the area I'm more interested in is how to analyze, how to mine, how to try to extract knowledge of that big data using machine learning and data science uh, techniques. So how much data is big data? How many megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes? So it's actually really difficult or almost impossible to answer uh, that question. There isn't a standard definition, but there is one definition I want to read out for you because I find it uh, quite, quite good in my, in my opinion. Big data involves data whose volume, diversity and complexity requires new techniques, algorithms and analysis to extract valuable knowledge, which is going to be typically hidden. Right. So if you are having a really big spreadsheet, let's say, for example, COVID cases, right, that, that kind of case that, oh, I don't have any other column in that spreadsheet. Is that big data? Yeah, not quite big data. If you're using a very uh, cool machine learning algorithm from the scikit-learn library from with Python, it might not be big data either. Right. So is it 20 megabytes is one terabyte? It all depends on what you need to do with that particular data set, right? So you might be using uh, a very simple algorithm to do account. So for that, you might have a really huge data set and you can do it with your with your laptop. So it might not be even big data. Uh, but if you need to run a genetic algorithm to find out uh, whatever and optimize whatever parameters for a deep learning algorithm, well, there might it might be that the data, it cannot be that big anyways, right? Because you are not going to be able to do it with one computer. So simply put, big data, in my opinion, is when you need more than one computer to be able to deal with the data. It's also very important to remember that what we call big data today might be almost nothing tomorrow, right? So computers are evolving and we have more and more memory every day and the ability to process and compute more uh, and faster. So you might think today one gig of data might be a lot, but maybe that tomorrow is almost nothing, right? So the definition cannot be just precisely an amount of data. It's not about the volume. It's much more than that. It's when you need that answer and how you need that analysis and what kind of analysis you need to be doing. So Sean, how much data do you think we have at the minute in the world? In the world? Yeah. I thought you meant on this uh, SD card that I'm recording with, <laughs> I was going to say. What happens after terror? Is it better? What happens after yeah, that? Yeah, then, then you got more and more and more, right? So I, I think there's uh, going to be a lot of zeros on the end. A end. lot of zeros there. So at the beginning of 2020, the digital universe was estimated to be 44 zettabytes of data. But I'm not so sure how accurate that figure is, right? But what it means is we are actually collecting data all the time. And somehow we are a little bit under the impression that having more data um, and having data is the new kind of the new goal and everybody wanted it, right? And is that for sure something that we need? Do we really need to collect data for the sake of it? And that might be something for another video, but uh, that's something else. How sustainable is to keep storing data just for, for the fun of it. But what I want to do today is to, okay, let's say we want to store data. How do we do it? How we can analyze that data? It's, it's about the quality of the data, right? It's all about the quality. It's not about the quantity, right? So sometimes the problem is we don't know where the quality is. And therefore, we need to gather the, the data, collect it, and then use pre-processing techniques to be able to shrink that data and just get that that is of good quality. Some people call it smart data. It's like hunting for gold, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. All right. So how do we deal with big data? So let's say, Sean, that you've got, you know, you've got um, a data set and you want to do something and you're running some machine learning and you've got your computer at home, right? And you're a very lucky guy and you've got 16 gigs of RAM and you've got one terabyte of drive and you're running there your favorite machine learning algorithm. Let's say that you're running random forest. You're trying to do something, some analysis with your data. You've got here your data 
and then you're trying to run random forest and all of a sudden what you get is out of memory right what do you do uh well you uh, restart <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. I've been using Windows too long. Uh, that's the problem. If you're if you're using win Windows, that's your own mistake, right? So you should be using something else to make sure that you don't get that message. But let's assume that this is not the problem. A good computer scientist would probably say, mm, "I'm going to try to optimize the memory utilization of my algorithm." But probably you're using some library to run this random forest, right? So you don't really know the implementation details of that uh, particular library. So you try to run that, and you say, "Oh, damn it! I think." I will probably need a little bit more memory. So what you do is you go and buy some more and then you say, I'm gonna get 64 gigabytes of RAM. Then you run it, everything goes well, happy days, everybody happy. And this is what we call scale up or vertical scalability. So scale up or vertical scalability is real good when it works, right? So if you can just simply buy a little bit more memory, if you have enough money, that's all good. But there will be a limit. You will not be able to go above that limit, right? So 64, what if then later on that data set becomes even bigger and then you try again and you say out of memory again, are you gonna go and buy 128 or 256? I mean, if you're rich, maybe you want to try, but you might not be able to do it, right? But whenever possible, if you can stick to this approach, please, by all means, scale up all the time. That's what we want to do uh, because it will be more efficient in terms of energy as well, consumption and anything. What is the solution if we cannot do it with one single computer? Well, that surely is when you bring in a second or third or fourth. Ah, computer. exactly. So rather than using one single computer, what you're going to do is to use a few of them. How do we call this? Uh, server phone? I don't know. Scale up, this is going to be scale out or horizontal scalability, right? So we're going to try to spread the computational cost of whatever analysis, whatever algorithm you're running across a number of computers. So basically a divide and conquer approach. And you might be thinking, oh, that's fantastic. And so what is the problem with that? That's brilliant, right? Yeah, but there are a few issues you need to bear in mind. So the first thing is here, when you're using one single computer, you're going to be able to use your random forest from uh, the scikit-learn library, right, straight away, or from any uh, programming language you're using. But if you've got a few computers, you need to bear in mind they are all independent. They all have their own hard drive or solid straight drive. They have their own RAM memory here, right? And, and they can be helping to solve the analysis that you want to do, but you need to explicitly and in some way design that distributed computing. And that is big data. Whenever we need to distribute the computing, we need to think how to use multiple computers to be able to use it. The problem is you've got to use a network for communication across those computers. And that is actually really expensive. And a network equipment is expensive and also it becomes the main bottleneck sometimes because we're gonna be moving data around all the time, right? So another issue of this, um, it doesn't come for free to doing this, uh, to be doing this uh, scale out is space. You need more computers and also energy. And actually you might be thinking they are, they are just standard desktop computer, but they are not. They are normally, well, you know, racks of computers. And you might be thinking, I said, you're talking about HPC, right? High performance computing. Yes, that's what I'm talking about, right? So yes, you can put all of them. You have to put the network. It's going to be more costly, but it allows you to do quite a few things. The first thing that allows you is if the data keeps growing, you simply need to add in one more machine to the mix, right? So you simply put one more machine and you're able to cope with more and more data as you go, which is good and it's gonna be cheaper than upgrading um, uh, your own computer. There is one more thing that is quite interesting from the big data point of view to do a scale out. So imagine you have a really powerful machine and you're running your deep learning algorithm there, right? And But it takes a little bit long because it's a lot of data and it takes, well, let's say 18 days to get that sorted. And after day 17, something goes wrong, crashes, and you need to start off from the very beginning. If you were able to design a distributed solution to run the same algorithm, 
if one of these computers crashes, you can still restart that operation in, that, in there and manage to get the result faster than with one single computer. And that's what we call in big data the ability to deal with faults, right? So it's fault tolerance. That is one of the key aspects we want to keep in mind when we are designing distributed solutions for uh, big data. All right, so you might be saying, okay, Isaac, what you're talking about here is high performance computing, right? And that's no surprise, you're dealing with loads of data and therefore you need to, you really, really need to use multiple computers to do so. And that's very true, but traditionally those HPCs, so you're gonna have multiple computers, each one of them with their own HDD or uh, solid state drive, their own RAM memory, their own operating system as well. Typically it's gonna be a Linux server as well. They are connected through a network and also there is one more network that allows you to have a central storage. So typically what you normally have or what we used to have traditionally in HPC is a relatively small input data, right? So you've got your input data here, this small square that I'm drawing here, and what's gonna happen is that this one will be loaded in main memory in all of those computers in there, right? And then what they do is they do some sort of computation here, and what they used to do this kind of, imagine for example, any optimization algorithm trying to solve some uh, big optimization problem or simulation and stuff like that. What they do is they use this InfiniBand to share those computation across computers to solve the bigger problem. But what happens if instead of having this small piece of data, you've got loads of this? What do you think is going to happen, Sean? Well, that data is going to get shifted around a lot. Yeah, so now the problem with big data that I also like to call big data data intensive applications is that they're going to spend most of their time reading and writing, right? So they will need to read from here and load this one here. So this one here will go here, then here, then here, and the same thing. So what's going to happen is this network will crash. It will not be able to cope with the amount of data and that is moving across the network. So when you have a big data application, a traditional HPC cluster will not do the trick. We need something else. What do we need? Uh, big, bigger hard disks. Yeah, well, actually we do have a, a really huge central storage, which is normally really expensive. So what is the solution? We've got the HDDs here. All this, well, maybe if you're lucky, solid straight drive um, there, right? So what we could do is to try to make a better use of those and that's what it makes, instead of a HPC cluster, it's going to be a big data um, cluster. So a big data cluster will look exactly the same, but now we're going to be using the hard drive that I'm representing down here. So we're going to have multiple computers, I'm going to just throw three of them, each one of them with their own hard drive. And here, what you can do is to spread the data across the different computers. Imagine a really big data set. Well, the hello world for big data is always counting the words that you've got in a very big file. So imagine I have a big file um, and I'm going to try to split that into, well, let's say six pieces, right? So I have here, I'm going to have the first chunk, the third one, the fourth, the fifth, and one again. What you want to do is to keep all the computation happening just locally in those drives. So what you want to do is to get that big data set spread across a number of computers rather than having it in a central storage that is connected by networks. So this is not a good idea in big data. You want to keep it locally. And something I, I did on purpose, and do you notice I have this number one here and this number one here representing, for example, just a chunk of the same file. Why do you think I did this? Was it for fault tolerance? Was it? Exactly, exactly. Imagine that this machine crashes. So this uh, piece of the data we want to make sure is somewhere available so you can still process it, right? So that is obviously what you want to do. So this is basically a way to create a distributed file system, a file system that will transparently, and by that I mean you don't really need to care about the details underneath in that file system. You simply say, this machine says, I want to access a or I want to access one, I just access it and I have it locally. And that is what we call in big data, the principle of data locality. Try to keep 
the data you're going to be using locally in every single machine. And that's what distinguishes a big data cluster from standard HPC cluster, right? So that's the key thing uh, to, to make it work. Um, and that is actually the main motto of this MapReduce paradigm that Rebecca actually explained in another video, which is all about the idea of moving computation is cheaper than moving computation and data at the same time. What you want to do is to apply an operation yeah, through all the data. The how, you don't really care about. Which machine is doing it, you don't really care about it either. You simply want to run your analysis and you want to get it done quickly and efficiently. And for that, you want to avoid input output data going through the network. And that's what you want to do using a big data uh, technology like Apache Hadoop and Apache Spark that we will see in future videos. It would put this into what's called a key value pair. So we're going to take each word as the key. So for each word within this, we'll map it so that the word's the key and then we put the number one next. function through the use of three Gaussians um, and giving me the, this three peaks in the distribution showing.